All right. Greetings. Greetings to everyone who's here in real time and to those who are here in the future watching the recording. So the topic for today um, is all about the Middle East Study Center at Ohio State, where I work. I'm the assistant director. I'm, my name is Melinda McClymans. Um, uh, but also Middle East Study Centers across the United States. Um, so it is focused, uh, the topic today is focused on the U.S. context more than the Middle East, which is unusual, I think, for our just what we do at the Middle East Study Center, but I thought it would be a worthwhile topic to include and just give some background information and context for why we have the podcast. So this is the Keys to Understanding the Middle East podcast from Ohio State University. Um, and um, it's a product of the Middle East Studies Center at Ohio State University. And I'm gonna try to um, really stay focused on the purpose of the Middle East Study Center and why they're needed, why, why Middle East Study Centers are needed. And I'm, in a nutshell, our mission and purpose is about cultural context. So we're bringing cultural context into the classroom, into discussions about the Middle East, into research. Um, we're bringing it to the public. We're giving the public opportunities to um, experience Middle Eastern culture as much as possible, as much as they can, not being there by, um, uh, I guess, transferring the key contextual um, and circumstantial um, realities of the Middle East. So by bringing speakers who are from the Middle East, or even, you know, they get, nowadays because of the pandemic and we're on Zoom so much, they can literally be in the Middle East while they're speaking at our programs. But in the past, we've always done that. We've placed an emphasis on um, people who've done field work in the Middle East, you know, scholars, they might not themselves be, you know, might not have been born in the Middle East, but who can convey like authentic um, perspectives and experiences because they've actually been there. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be based on physical experiences. It can also be, um, you know, let's hear from authors from the Middle East. What is the research saying in the Middle East about this topic in addition to what the research here is saying? Um, so it, it, it has so many di dimensions and again, um, cultural context is our purpose in a nutshell and, um, you know, providing context, but specifically, uh, we try to shed light on circumstances in the Middle East that shape culture. Um, you know, the, like how things came to be the way they are. Um, so history is always really important. Um, and then also, how does this look like? Like, what does this actually mean in the Middle East? What is daily life like? What, what, what would this mean if you were actually there? So whenever you're talking about history, you're talking about, you know, a field at <laughs> a field at the university, of course, obviously. And so we do have, uh, like, if you look at um, the faculty focused on the Middle East at Ohio State, a good portion of them are historians, um, probably one of the largest percentages of like, if you look at all the research happening at Ohio State are historians, and that's not uncommon. Middle East study centers have, um, at least the ones that I'm going to be talking about today, have um, usually had a preponderance of faculty members from the history department and the language department. Um, often it's called a language and cultures department. At Ohio State, our departments are called Near Eastern Languages and Cultures and then the Department of History. So most of the largest percentage of our faculty are located there and they're doing qualitative work. They're looking at how things work. Um, you know, we also have amazing quantitative analysts that are shedding light on 
um, you know, the reality is in the Middle East, we've got um, a pop population uh, research institute at Ohio State that is using primarily statistics and mathematical analyses to shed light on family and fertility and, you know, how family works, not only in the Middle East, but in the world and what the factors are. So um, my, my take on it personally is you need all these things um, to really, uh, to really, you know, do justice to any region you're looking at in the world. Okay, so, 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 so why do we have a Middle East Studies Center? Um, and, and first of all, you know, if, if we're asking about why, why such centers exist, um, I think it's important to look at the history. So specifically, why did we start calling them, why do we call them Middle East Studies Centers? Why did we start calling this region the Middle East? Um, I mean, a quick answer to that is in the 1950s, that term started getting used in the U.S. more and in, on the news or universities or just in our, in our society, in our culture, in our way of thinking about the world. Um, that term was popularized in, in the 50s, roughly. Um, but the Middle East is a really subjective term. And it's the definition of the Middle East has shifted wildly over time, um, including, you know, going way far east at sometimes, including all the way into South Asia, including India, um, going, you know, west into, you know, all the way to Morocco, sometimes including Turkey, sometimes not. Sometimes Turkey is considered European, not Middle Eastern. You know, it's really, it's a really subjective term and, and it's, um, and it's because there's, you know, if you try to say that there's this cultural place, like there's a Middle Eastern culture, um, I mean, actually you could say that in, in, in some ways, but only really broadly. It's, it's really hard to just, you know, um, you know, claim that there's one Middle Eastern culture, or one Middle Eastern place. Um, and the term is, is um, it, it's, it's a Eurocentric term, right? So uh middle of where east of where like middle and east all are in reference to europe um and also in reference to kind of an east west divide that started in medieval times but maybe earlier because in, med in medieval times jerusalem was thought of i'm sorry i'm, I'm in a new <laughs> in a new place um, for this podcast and the sun is shifting. So I'm trying to make that better. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of squint throughout this um, because the sun is going to do what it does. So, so yeah. So where was I? Um, right. So for medieval scholars, the center of the world was Jerusalem. Um, you know, in Europe, Christianity was very much a part of the worldview. And so the center of everything was Jerusalem. And so that kind of set up like a center point between East and West in people's minds. And if you look at, uh, there's actually a book called Learning to Divide the World by Wilinsky, W-I-L-L-I-N-S-K-Y. And it's a really good look at geography and how, and you know, how we think how we kind of map the world in our minds. And that affects the way we think about the world as well. And, you know, it definitely is embedded within the term Middle East and even in the concept of Middle East studies centers in the United States. Um, the other thing to be aware of on that front is just that, um, you know, the, the age of exploration. So, um, European countries, like when, when, you know, military technology kind of developed um, ships that could go further and like industrial technology developed ways to kind of process um, crops into products to sell and um, plantation style agriculture started to become, you know, um, seen as, um, you know, a, a 
profitable way for countries to grow. There started to be this competition in Europe, and, and I'm including Turkey in Europe in this case because the Ottoman Empire was a major naval power, and probably even beyond that scope. And but there was like this competition to get resources from around the world, like basically to rule the world or just to you know um, explore the world, but also to get get resources. And um, part of that was research and just you know finding out, exploring what was out there. And um, usually at the expense of the people they were studying or getting resources from. So that's a major problem. Because uh, that's kind of a, that, that's still kind of embedded in the way we do things now uh, in terms of, uh, you know, um, that really ethnocentric perspective on the world, Eurocentric perspective. It's still very much a part of curriculum at, at universities and in, in schools. And so that also is, you know, part of uh, the term the Middle East because it, it, that was a reference point for um, scholars of the age of exploration and then the enlightenment, you know, at, you know, moving forward with scholarship at universities and the way they looked at the world. Okay, and so you know the the reason for you know going into this history a little bit is just to really emphasize that the term Middle East is problematic not only because it's subjective, which it is, which I already you know started off with, and that makes it just slippery. And you know what exactly are you talking about when you say the Middle East? And I'm not even sure if it's the word we should use, honestly, even though it's the it's a part of the title of this podcast. So maybe at some point we'll rebrand and just have a totally different name. But um, but then there's also a need to communicate with people and we are focused on, on the region known as the Middle East. So that's kind of like the central issue and um, uh, why I wanted to go into terminology um, a little bit. Um, and then just, and then that leads me up to the 1950s that I mentioned where, um, you know, basically in the 50s, there, uh, the higher education, okay, so the government, the federal government of the United States passed law and, you know, for higher education in the United States that included, um, uh, you know, a line item for international studies. So that's called Title VI. So, so they set that up and other, you know, related programs, the State Department also set stuff up, you know, State Department is our, like our foreign policy department um, to basically ensure that Americans could study world regions outside of the traditional curriculum. So to broaden it and make it more global. So they, so basically like Title VI specifically, which is really what it's, the main driving factor why we have a Middle East Studies Center at Ohio State is Title VI. It Title VI didn't just study, didn't just uh, support Middle East studies. It was saying let's make sure all world regions are included in our curriculum, not just Europe, North America, the Western world. You know, um, Ohio, Columbus. You know, where I'm sitting. Let's let's make sure, let's counterbalance the kind of, you know, ethnocentric or just way of looking at the world where, you know, um, the focus is on self-interest, self-protection, national interests, and things like that. Not so much to say we shouldn't have national interests, but to just have like a way to balance that out. And they were really motivated because, you know, after World War II, um, the United States became kind of more of a, um, not a superpower yet, but almost like like looking at the looking at the world as like, oh, we're on this global stage, and we need to, um, you know, be a player and be be you know content be a contender on the world stage, and and if we don't have experts on world areas outside of the United States, it's going to be hard to do that. So, so that's how that started. And so 
here at Ohio State, um, we started getting Title VI funds beginning in 1969. That's the earliest I could find uh, Title VI um, funding for you know studying languages of the Middle East anyway, and probably earlier for Russian language. So I, I'm just speaking now for the Middle East Studies Center. I, I, I just know the history of our center better, but we have multiple area study centers at Ohio State. Um, so we have um, Slavic and East European Studies Center. We have the East Asian Studies Center. Um, we have the African Studies Center. We have the Latin American Studies Center. We do not have South Asia as of yet, but I think um, that could be coming soon. And we have a uh, global gateway in India. Um, so, you know, there are multiple ways that the university is funding and also just ensuring that there is that global coverage. And, but Title VI has always been kind of the quote unquote, it's often called the gold standard for internationalization at universities. Like it means you're do doing what you're supposed to do um, according to Kind of consensus of university faculty mm, um, yeah i would say there's also you know disagreements on what that means but there is kind of a consensus that that title six is a good sign for what you're doing in terms of teaching the languages of your area and making sure students can actually learn about the cultures in depth and not just from like an American foreign policy point of view, although that's fine. But I, I mean, in my opinion, that's fine. It's as long as you're also understanding global policy and global politics from within the region so that you're learning, you know, you're getting a more nuanced understanding of the way things work and it's not from a single perspective. So, so I just, I just wanted to, um give that background first and then also just um you know go back to that problem of well what if we what if we stopped calling it the middle east what if we just regrouped and said you know that's that's a term that really comes from a very eurocentric perspective and we're wanting to be more inclusive at universities um, we're wanting to make amends for the um, for the past in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, Black Lives Matter was about that in terms of, um, you know, uh, America's part in enslavement and then in institutionalized racism and in just um, unfair treatment right now, you know, and racialization of, of people, making them into a category that's, you know, um, mistreated, you know. So we're really contending with that right now at universities. And, and with regard to the Middle East, that, that implies we need to look at the past as well and, and talk about, you know, how we can be teaching it about the Middle East now in a way that is making amends for, you know, um, intervening, intervening, and intervening, or you know, making, um, getting involved in things in the region, doing things, you know, in the region, uh, shaping the region in in different ways, not based on what people actually needed there or what they wanted, but based on you know completely unrelated things unrelated to what is actually relevant to the region and related more to, um, you know, um, conflicts within Europe, conflicts uh, between, you know, um, global dominance, like this co competition just has really continued right into the present day. You know, the Cold War was about that. And, you know, just trying to, you know, fry for power, worldwide. So that has tended to take precedence, unfortunately. And, um, you know, kind of really make problems, make things worse in the Middle East and in, in terms of, um, you know, drawing political 
boundaries. So like if you look at the, the countries of the Middle East on the map today, um, a lot of the boundaries were just drawn by like Britain or France uh, after the First World War and, and didn't have a lot to do with what made sense to people there. So that's just one example. Um, population exchanges between countries that, you know, were meant to sort of prevent conflict, but created a lot of a lot of issues. There's a lot of unforeseen consequences for these kind of superficial ways of problem solving that, you know, I think come out of that framework. So we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. That's what I should have just said <laughs> after instead of this long winded explanation, but we don't want to uh, repeat those mistakes. So in order to not repeat them, we have to think differently and research differently in a way that, you know, understands different perspectives and takes into account, like if we're studying about the Middle East, we also at the same time need to be learning from the Middle East. So I hope that makes sense because that way, you know, that's the only way we're going to be on an even ground worldwide is if we're learning from each other. And um, obviously also for ethical and equitable, you know, in how we, how, you know, how we behave in the world. Um, but that's kind of a discussion for another time, like in terms of foreign policy, I, you know, that uh, I think is important, but uh, don't know if I have the, have the ability to really address it properly right now. So um, I hope that made sense. Um, I, it, that's actually, this is the first time I've done this talk. I mean, usually when I talk to classes, I just kind of say, you know, before we start talking about the Middle East, let's just ask middle of where, east of where, and just, you know, um, recognize the Eurocentric nature of that term. But I think the other problem with that term is like, um, whenever you're studying about an area, you're kind of you're kind of objectifying it. You're, you know, um, you're setting yourself up to look at it from an outsider's point of view. I mean, that's, that's the perspective you're using. And, um, and that's just one perspective. So I, so rather than just studying it from that perspective or from kind of, you know, looking at things in terms of just mathematics and numbers and universals, like just, finding out, well, what does that actually look like there? Because, I mean, you're going to be surprised about some things and you're going to you're going to have a lot of eye opening things that you learn about the reality there. So I'm just saying the reality has to be a part of, you know, the way we study about a world region. And that's why the Middle East Study Center exists to bring context into all the discussions, even the even the fields that mainly focus on context like anthropology and history and geography still can use a very broad, you know, kind of um, broad approach to make make the understanding better for everyone's, you know, that kind of takes into account, yeah, these disciplinary views, like what is what is the geography? What is the shape of things? Like how do people experience life in terms of like the architecture, the buildings, the, the, the roads, all those all the circumstances of the place that's going to bring in multiple disciplines. And I think it's so important to, to do that and to really, um, you know, do your best to try to imagine, well, what's daily life like there? Like, what does that actually mean there? <laughs> and that's what, uh, so that question, like, what does that actually mean there? I feel like that's the touch point for the Middle East Studies Center at Ohio State. And I don't know if we should still be called the Middle East Studies Center. I'd love to hear from you. I don't know if we should still call it area studies or maybe just, you know, chuck that out the window and talk about something like diverse global perspectives or context or um, maybe look at it completely differently, like how things are interconnected. Like, you know, we have the Silk Road, like trade routes or other kind of, you know, ways of circulating knowledge and information and culture. Look at it through those circulations that are global. You know, I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, so I, I'd love to hear from you. And actually, I'm thinking I might learn how to do a poll on Facebook or one of the tools that are available and just ask, you know, what are your thoughts? I would love to get your input. 
So, and I don't see, I see I've got a couple people here. Oh, okay. So from Yerub Arabaiti, you pointed out a great point. I always ask people, what's come to your mind when you heard the term Middle East? From the answer, we can start. Yeah, that, so lots of things would come to mind, right? No, that's, that's fantastic, Abaidi, uh, Yerub Arabaiti. I mean, because I think what that allows you to do is stay focused on the present moment, um, look at kind of the jumble of images and objects and ideas that we associate with the Middle East because they're so strong in our culture and our society. And this is true in the United States, but I think it's also true in the Middle East because a lot of the ideas about the Middle East are that come from Europe and America are internalized as well. So they tend to come up there as well. Um, and just say, well, let's deconstruct this. Like, let's not let words have power over us. Let's use our critical minds to have power over words and, you know, talk about the reality. So that's, that is a great starting point. And it also brings up a lot of stereotypes you can de de deconstruct that are common that I don't want to get into right now. But if you've done that many times over the years, you'll find like there's patterns, there's common stereotypes that come up or just associations people have like kind of general. Like one of the ones that I talk about as a guest lecture in, in people's classes is, you know, the idea of the Middle East in terms of um, a, a, kind of as a place that oppresses women. Um, and um, that's a complicated subject because that is that is a stereotype, but then at the same time, women are oppressed in the Middle East. So it's not like, uh, you, like breaking down stereotypes has to do with just putting on your thinking cap and deconstructing stuff and also putting things into perspective because if you look at the gender gap worldwide, and, and actually the Global Gender Gap Report just came out. I highly recommend you check it out. If you look at it worldwide, there's a gender gap everywhere. There's violence against women everywhere. There's, you know, a lack of representation in government for not only of women, but for the things that really matter to women. Um, you know, and so there's a spectrum. So no country's perfect. You know, there's some that are doing better and some that are doing worse, but no one's perfect. And that includes, you know, the Middle East, but also right here in Columbus, Ohio, we've got a lot of work to do. So you have to put it in perspective. So I think I'm going to wrap this up. It's been almost a half hour. Um, normally I have guests um, and it takes a lot longer to get through this just because I'm interviewing them and we're going really in depth into their research. I did do some research for today for you all. So I hope, I hope you got some some good information from it and things you want to check out. Um, and, you know, I'm always working on, on um, my lectures and trying to give them, or if you want to call it a lecture, more like a presentation, try to give them over and over till, till they get better. So any feedback you have, ways I could make it better would be great. And I might do it again, you know, when I'm doing outreach in the community and stuff like that. So let me know. And it's been great being with you. So I hope you have a great day or a great evening wherever you are.